This is the 5 minute guide to the Yamato class, battleships of the Imperial Japanese Navy. The Yamato class were the largest and most heavily armed battleships ever actually built, and as such have achieved a kind of semi-legendary status. However, it's somewhat ironic that we actually know relatively little about them as compared to something like the Iowa, Vanguard or Bismarck, largely because of a combination of Allied bombing and Japanese intransigence towards the end of the Second World War, which put a lot of Japanese naval records to the torch. But fortunately, enough survived to have a reasonable idea of what the ships were. As with so many ships of the Second World War, the Yamato class were greatly influenced by the naval treaties of the 1920s and 1930s, albeit not in terms of trying to actually comply with a limit or even quietly lying about complying with a limit. The problems the Japanese faced from these treaties were that both displacement and gun calibre were equally limited for all nations, per ship. But Japan had to agree to a navy three-fifths the size of the American or British fleets. This in turn meant that Japan would almost certainly lose a war with either nation relatively quickly, simply due to her fleet being significantly outnumbered. In the 1930s the Japanese government was rapidly becoming militant and expansionistic, with the aim of making the western Pacific region into the territory of the Japanese Empire. This would mean war with multiple powers, including most likely either Britain, America or both. Both of these nations started with larger fleets and had vastly more industrial output than Japan, so would hold both the short-term advantage of numbers and the long-term advantage of simply being able to outbuild the Japanese. Indeed, certain members of US Congress at the time had talked of outbuilding Japan 3 to 1 if it restarted a naval arms race, with Congress's penny-pinching of earlier years somewhat forgotten. Japan, for its part, had withdrawn from the various naval treaties by the mid-1930s. As a result, they hit on a cunning plan. Instead of incrementally stepping up battleship design, as everyone had done historically, and instead of trying to match their enemies ship for ship, Japan would instead build fewer, much larger ships. Ships capable of taking on multiple opponents at once. Since a ship twice the size of the treaty battleships would not actually cost twice as much, this would, in theory, allow Japan to match or overwhelm a numerically larger force at a level of expense that it could sustain. Even if the enemy started to build their own ships to match, the hope was that Japan could secure what it needed after the initial enemy forces were destroyed, but before the new ships came online, during which time Japan would simply repeat the trick with even bigger ships. In the mid-1930s, therefore, a total of two dozen preliminary designs were studied, with guns ranging from 16 to 18.1 inches in calibre, and a huge variety of secondary batteries, some focusing more on anti-aircraft firepower, others on anti-destroyer firepower, and still others on secondary batteries designed to single-handedly fight off the escorting cruisers of any Allied fleet. Propulsion and protection also varied wildly, from slow ships with ultra-heavy armour and lighter guns, to ships with ultra-heavy guns, but very much faster with lighter armour, and everything in between. Of these, two designs were selected for the final consideration, design A140F3 and A140F4, the main difference between the two being operational range, the F3 design having about two-thirds the range of F4. In the end, the longer range F4 design won out with a final change to all turbine propulsion owing to issues with diesel engines in other ships weighing against any hybrid power plants. Five ships were planned, with a standard displacement of 64,000 tonnes each. As with German practice, the ships were not named at the start of construction, so the last two will only ever be known as warships number 111 and 797, the first three receiving the names Yamato, Musashi and Shinano. All three vessels were built in extreme secrecy to prevent enemy intelligence from learning of their existence and specifications, since if people could see how big and powerful the ships were whilst they were being built, they would be able to start on their own equally large and powerful ships, giving Japan too narrow a window of opportunity to act. This went as far as to enclose the entire construction area in a building that, for obvious reasons, was even larger than the ship. This effort actually worked quite well, although the length of the ship was easily worked out just by looking at the building and closing it, the estimates of what was inside got the beam wrong, guessing that a figure that was 17 feet too narrow, 
and a displacement of between 40 and 57,000 tonnes, vastly less than the now 69,000 tonnes that they actually were. Even after the Yamato had actually been in service and then been sunk in 1945, most commentators were still citing the ships as 45,000 tonnes and armed with nine 16-inch guns, i.e. broadly similar to an Iowa class. The design of the 60,000-ton Montanas were heavily influenced by these estimates, so one wonders what exactly the American designers would have come up with had they known the true nature of the Yamatos. The actual main battery of the ships was of course nine 460mm or 18.1 inch naval guns, mounted in three huge turrets, each of which weighed more than a typical 1930s era destroyer. Two of these would be super firing forward and one would be placed aft. As well as the usual AP and HE shells, they could also fire Type 3 anti-aircraft shells. In these shells a time fuse was used to set how far away the shells would explode, and each shell, upon detonation, would release 900 incendiary-filled tubes in a 20-degree cone facing towards incoming aircraft, along with the remains of the shell itself in the form of steel splinters. Each tube would burn for about 5 seconds at 3,000 degrees, with a 5-metre or 15-foot flame. Whilst hugely visually impressive, these shells inflicted severe damage on the barrels of the main guns themselves, and in the event US pilots considered these shells to be more of a pyrotechnics display than a competent anti-aircraft weapon. The original secondary battery was made up of 12 6-inch guns in four triple turrets, one forward, one on each wing, and one aft, giving it a broadside equivalent to many light cruisers. The turrets were literally lifted off the Megami-class cruisers when these had been rearmed with twin 8-inch guns. The initial anti-aircraft battery consisted of 12 5-inch guns in six twin turrets, three on each side, and a further 24 25mm anti-aircraft guns, primarily mounted amidships. In 1944, both ships had massive anti-aircraft upgrades. The two 6-inch wing turrets were removed, and replaced with three additional 5-inch twin turrets each, bringing these up to 24 guns total with the vast numbers of extra 25mm guns installed for a total of 162 such weapons. Although these are widely regarded as the single worst anti-aircraft weapons of the war, using 15 round magazines and having numerous issues with accuracy and range. The ship also had two twin mounts for 13.2mm anti-aircraft machine guns, one on each side of the bridge. The armament on Shinano was necessarily quite different, as she was never finished as a battleship and instead converted to a support aircraft carrier. No primary or secondary guns were carried, instead 16 5-inch guns, 125 25mm anti-aircraft guns, and 336 5-inch anti-aircraft rocket launchers in 12 28-barrel turrets were installed. To match this massive gun battery, and since they were designed to engage multiple enemy battleships simultaneously, the Yamatos were fitted with heavy armour plating. The main belt of armour along the side of the vessel was just over 16 inches thick, and inclined at 20 degrees to increase the effective thickness. The armour on the main turrets was a truly ridiculous 26 inches thick. The main armour deck was also very thick at just under 8 inches. However, this has to be balanced against the fact that Japanese metallurgy was somewhat behind the curve of most other nations, particularly the British and Germans who possessed the best quality armour plate in the world at the time, so the effective thickness as compared to other battleships is slightly less than the raw figures would otherwise suggest. The torpedo protection system was designed to be equally comprehensive, but possessed a number of construction and design flaws that significantly reduced its actual effectiveness, making torpedo attack these ships Achilles heel. All of this was propelled by a huge power plant that could get the ships up to 27 knots. Yamato was ordered in March 1937, laid down in November of the same year, launched in 1940, and commissioned a few days after Pearl Harbor on the 16th of December 1941, joining the fleet in May 1942. Yamato served as the flagship of the Japanese combined fleet during the Battle of Midway, but as an aircraft carrier fight, the ship didn't actually engage enemy forces during the battle. The next two years were spent mostly in various ports, with deployments mainly in an attempt to counteract American carrier raids on Japanese island bases. On the 25th of December 1943, she suffered major torpedo damage at the hands of the USS Skate, and was forced to return to the Kure 
naval base for repairs and structural upgrades. Her next major engagement would be in 1944 at the Battle of the Philippine Sea, serving as an escort to a Japanese carrier division, followed by a role in the centre force at the Battle of Leyte Gulf, where she finally got to use her guns against an enemy vessel for the first, and as it turned out, only time, helping to sink the American escort carrier Gambia Bay and the destroyer Johnston before she was forced to turn away by torpedoes from USS Heerman, which put her out of combat. Musashi was ordered in March 1937, laid down a year later, launched in November 1940 and commissioned on the 5th of August 1942. With nothing major of note in her first few years of operation, on March 1944 she sustained moderate damage near the bow from one torpedo fired by the American submarine Tunney. Shinano was laid down as the third member of the Yamato class, to a modified design where most of the original armour values were slightly reduced in order to add protection for fire control equipment and lookout positions, and to allow the 5-inch secondary armament to be replaced with 3.9-inch guns. But following the Japanese defeat at Midway, construction of the Shinano was suspended. The hull was then rebuilt as an aircraft carrier. She was not meant to be a frontline vessel, but a 64,800 ton support vessel that would be capable of ferrying, repairing and replenishing the air fleets of other carriers. Shinano was launched on the 5th of October 1944 and commissioned little more than a month later on the 19th of November. Ten days after that, in the early morning, Shinano was hit by four torpedoes from the USS Archerfish. Although the damage seemed manageable, poor flooding control caused the vessel to list a starboard, and shortly before midday she capsized and sank, making her the largest naval vessel to ever have been sunk by a submarine. Yamato and Musashi would both meet spectacular ends. On the way to Leyte Gulf, Musashi was sank on the 24th of October 1944 during the Battle of the Sibiyan Sea, taking 17 bomb and 19 torpedo hits to put down. Yamato would be sunk on the 7th of April 1945 by a total of 386 American carrier aircraft during an attempt at fulfilling Operation Ten Go, receiving 10 torpedo and 7 bomb hits before capsizing, followed by the detonation of her main magazines. The Americans had learned from the Musashi, which had been attacked from all directions and gradually settled over several hours. Yamato instead received attacks that were all concentrated on one side, resulting in the ship capsizing from massive flooding after significantly fewer hits. Warship number 111 was also supposed to incorporate the improvements of Shinano. The ship's keel was laid after Yamato's launch in August 1940, but the resources essential to construct the ship would, would become far harder to obtain during World War II. As a result, at only about 30% complete, she was taken apart and scrapped in 1942. The materials salvaged from this were used in the conversion of the IC and her younger to battleship air aircraft carrier hybrids. The fifth vessel, warship number 797, was planned as an improved version of the Shinano design, but was never actually laid down. Finally, two battleships of an entirely new, larger design were planned as part of the 1942 fleet replenishment program. Design A-150 was based on the Yamatos and would have had a main battery of six 20-inch guns in three twin turrets, and secondary dual-purpose armament of 24 3.9-inch dual-purpose guns in twin mounts. The displacement was to be bigger than the Yamatos, with a side armour belt of 18 inches planned. As mentioned at the outset, records of the ship are incomplete. Although firebombing had destroyed some records, on the eve of the Allies' occupation of Japan, special service officers of the Imperial Japanese Navy destroyed virtually all remaining records, drawings, and photographs of or relating to the Yamato-class battleships, leaving only fragmentary records of the design characteristics and other technical matters. The destruction of these documents was so efficient that until 1948 the only known images of Yamato and Musashi were those taken by United States Navy aircraft involved in attacking the two battleships. Although a number of additional photographs and information from documents that were not destroyed have come to light over the intervening years, the loss of the majority of written records for the class has made extensive research into the Yamato class somewhat difficult. Because of the lack of written records, information from this class largely comes from interviews with Japanese officers following Japan's surrender. 
that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to tag your question with Q&A if you want to leave a question for the dry dock.